Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bianca Wenzel, and I would like to welcome you to the Society of Wetland Scientists December webinar. I want to offer a special welcome to any non-member guests we have joining us today for our quarterly free webinar. All of our webinars are complimentary to SWS members, but once a quarter we do open it up to the public. Before we get started with the presentation today, I would like to give you all um, a quick overview of what SWS is all about. Since its founding in 1980, the Society of Wetland Scientists has continued to grow with more than 3,000 members from around the world. We have a diverse membership hailing from all sectors of wetland science, including a large sector of students. We are committed to providing our members with meaningful resources that promote wetland education, conservation, and restoration globally. SWS membership includes full access to the Wetlands Journal, Wetlands Science and Practice, and other professional journals such as Wetlands Ecology and Management. In addition, SWS members enjoy discounted rates for the Professional Certification Program, which I'll talk about a bit more later access to regional chapter and section activities, student programs and grants, and discounted registration at the SWS annual meeting, all of which provides members the opportunity to network with wetland professionals from around the world. Please take a moment to visit our website at sws.org to learn more about becoming a member and all of our member benefits. Some special announcements. We're excited to announce that past webinars, three months or older, are available to the public on our SWS YouTube channel. You can visit our channel at the link shown here. Also through our program, you can get a webinar participation certificate, which will be recognized for one hour toward a professional wetland scientist certification and other continuing education programs. If you are a member, this is free. If you are a non-member, starting today, you can purchase a participation certificate at the SWS store for $20. Please visit our SWS store at our website for more information. This webinar has already been pre-approved by the SWS Professional Certification Program and is applicable for continuing education credits. Uh, participation certificates are available through an automated process, so all participants on this webinar today will receive an email from our SWS Business Manager, Michelle, either today or tomorrow. If you don't see it, please make sure that you check your spam folder all you need to do is click on the appropriate link to get your certificate. Partic participation certificates will also be available if you just watch the webinar recordings as well. Those you can find on our past webinars page, uh, which are shown here, uh, that page is shown here on the slide. So just some logistics. Um, the general format for today's webinar will be um, our presentations, a co-presentation by our speaker, about 30 minutes or so, followed by approximately 15 minutes for questions. At any time during the presentation, you can type any questions you may have into the questions pane. You don't have to wait until the end. You can type them in as they go. Um, all you need to do is indicate which speaker or speakers you might be addressing if you want to in particular, and I will then pose the questions to our presenters at the very end of the presentations. Another couple of things, this webinar is being recorded, so you'll receive a link to the recording after the webinar is over. 
We also ask that you take a moment to complete the evaluation survey to help us plan future events. If you would like a copy of today's slides, we have a PDF copy available for you in the handout section of the control pane. And if you're tech savvy, please use the hashtag SWSWebinar if you'd like to tweet about today's webinar. With all of that said, I'm very proud to introduce our webinar today and the presenters. Today is a very special webinar because we'll be hearing from one of our wetland ambassadors from 2018, and that is Tatiana. Tatiana Lobato um, and her research mentor, Dr. Karen Kettenring, will be presenting today. Tatiana is a PhD candidate at the Autonomous University of Querétaro in Mexico. This past year, she was chosen as one of SWS's wetland ambassadors. And through this research fellowship program, she traveled to Utah State University to work with um, under the mentorship of Dr. Karen Kettenring. Karin's research focuses on a mixture of ecology, genetics, and management of wetland plants. Today, we have the opportunity to hear about the research conducted during Tatiana's fellowship. If you are interested in becoming a wetland ambassador yourself, or if you know someone who may be interested, please stick around for the end of the, the webinar where we will announce our 2019 program and how to apply. And with that said, I now will turn it over to our presenters. Hi, this is Karin Kettenring, and I um, am excited to talk to you today about um, the research that Tatiana did as part of her wetland ambassador uh, visit to Utah State University. She'll be talking about the science, but I want to set this up a little bit. Um, but the talk today is going to focus on potential climate change impacts on native seeds relative to invasive Phragmites, a species that probably a number of you are very familiar with. And we will talk about the implications of this research for Great Salt Lake wetland restoration. And I don't think, oh, now I do have access to the slides. Okay. Um, so as uh, Bianca mentioned, this study was part of the uh, 2018 Wetland Ambassador Fellowship Program. So I want to um, just introduce the research team. On the left hand side there is Emily Martin and she is a PhD student in my lab here at Utah State and her dissertation research focuses on seed-based wetland restoration, particularly in Great Salt Lake wetlands. And uh, my research in my lab in general focuses on wetland plant ecology, research, uh, we focus a lot on seeds. And that was partly why it was great to have Tatiana here and for us to do a seed based project. We're interested in applied questions relative to or related to invasion, management and restoration. And we are really particularly interested in the impacts of Phragmites, Phragmites invasion and future management and restoration. And and how these impacts and management may be affected by climate change. And Tatiana will be talking about her research results um, during the presentation today. But uh, before we go any further, just a quick um, plug for the Wetland Ambassador Program. This was just a fantastic opportunity for my research lab and for me as well, um, in addition to Tatiana. And so for those of you that might be interested in this program, just wanted to mention some of the benefits that I see. For me, uh, being a faculty mentor, it was, it was great to learn about wetlands and research in other parts of the world, learning about where Tatiana's doing her research in Mexico, to see how other graduate programs are run as well as just to learn about other cultures. And part of this too was a cultural exchange for my family. We had a number of meals together where Tatiana joined me and my husband and my daughter for dinners and you know adventures around the state. So that was great. 
And it also, I think, was fantastic for Tatiana to be here and provide additional um, cultural exchanges and research uh, experiences to my own students. So it really lifted the research experiences of the students in my lab. And we really just had a great time. We're always smiling in these pictures. And I think for students that are considering this mentorship program, you have the um, opportunity to receive additional mentorship from other faculty and scientists that you may not be able to get to know otherwise. And then also learning too about wetlands and research in other parts of the world through the research that you do during the ambassador um, exchange. And I think expanding your, your collaborator, your research network is a really important, important part of your development as a student. And some of the connections that Tatiana made with students in my lab, I think will be friendships and collaborations that will go well into the future. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tatiana so she can talk about the project she did while she was here at Utah State. Thank you, Karen, uh, for sure. Um, it was an amazing experience to work in your lab, to meet new friends at the Utah State University, and uh, to learn more about seeds and uh, climate change. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Tatiana Lobata de Magalhães. I'm from Brazil, but now I am studying a PhD in Mexico. Uh, it's a pleasure to present to you the research I, that I have done as a SWS wetland ambassador. City-based restoration. Um, um, now I will talk more about uh, the scientific uh, results that you had in this research in Utah State University that's about the wetland restoration, seeds, and the climate change. Um, and the seed-based restoration has many benefits, whether logistical or financially. However, in the field, the plant establishment rates are often low and the unpredictable. Indeed, the seed germination performance is always affected by water and the temperature interactions. Climate change will increase it mortality rates of seeds and seed in the field. If we understand how the interaction between temperature and the water drives the seed germination, it will help us to improve the establishment rates and the restoration outcomes in wetlands. Also, we have to consider that native seeds sourced from various sites vary in performance which can result in different germination outcomes and the multiple climate change scenarios. In the future, wetlands will become drier on average and the drought extremes may become common. What worries us when we look at the freshwater ecosystem is that there is a lack of climate change experiments, or these studies present a relatively simple approach. And how does climate change impact seed germination? Some seeds, some species may germinate with faster rates under higher temperatures, getting a competitive advantage over later germination ones. Plus, temperature and the drought extremes would impose an abiotic limit, providing the germination and the establishment of sensitive species in the plant community. Oops. Oh, sorry. Um, how can, I think I have a problem to return the slides. Hi, Tatiana, what slide do you need? Uh, sorry, can you return it tomorrow, Tony? Yeah, not one more. 
Thank you. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, here. Sorry for that. Um, yeah, the research team at the Wetland Ecology Lab and Utah State University have been working with several aspects of seed ecology and the wetland restoration in the Great Salt Lake wetlands. Uh, Great Salt Lake is a huge place, and the Great Salt Lake wetlands are a critical resource in the Intermountain West and are globally significant for millions of migratory birds that depend on this habitat. Unfortunately, uh, Great Salt Lake wetlands are trinitized by agriculture and the urban expansion and by the proliferation of invasive species. One that invasive species that is particularly harmful in the Great Salt Lakes is Phragmites australis. Phragmites seeds have high rates of germination. Uh, and the recent researches indicate that the Phragmarisis germination rate more than double under increased temperature conditions. Therefore, uh, climate change may also intensify the expansion of the invasive Phragmarisis. In this context, our study goal was to evaluate seed germination of wetland species under current and the future climate scenarios to compare native species and the invasive phragmarisis and also to evaluate the infraspecific variation in native species. We did two experiments in the wetland ecology lab using growth chambers and one field experiment in two sites of the Great Salt Lake wetlands. Where study questions uh, were how the change in temperature and the water potential impact seed germination, how do Boroshi versus Phragmarisis germination rates differ, how do germination rates differ between Boroshi seed sourced, and how does Boroshi seed germination vary with the different temperatures and the water potentials in the field. In the experiment one, uh, we used two native species, that is uh, Chenoplecton acutus and Chenoplecton americanus, and the one invasive species, Phragmarisis. In the experiment two, we use a different source of one native species, that is Chenoplecton acutus. And then finally, we, we went to the field to see how the native Iberoche seeds would work there uh, using um, Chenoplecton acutus and the Chenoplecton americanus seeds. These native species, uh, Chenoplecton acutus and Chenoplecton americanus, are critical food and nesting sources for migratory birds, and they are target species for the Great Salt Lake wetland uh, restoration. The invasive phragmites uh, form dense monotype coastlands and it displaces native vegetation, which degrades uh, habitat for wildlife and reduces the ability of Great Salt Lake wetlands to provide important ecological and economic services. We used seeds harvest from the Great Salt Lake wetlands for the experiment one and for the seed trial. And in the experiment two, we used seeds from uh, five wetlands across the intermountain with the wetlands in the Montana, Utah, and Nevada states, as you can see in this map. Uh, we broke the seed dormants by cold stratification, uh, stratify in most sand at 4 Celsius degrees to Chenoplecton acutus and Chenoplecton americanus. And we did not uh, dormance break treatment to phragmites. We carried out the experiment one and two in the lab using climate, climate models for the present 
in May, June, and July. And the future projections to June and July 2007, considering the Great Salt Lake localization. We simulated on the chambers for temperature regimes, that's 23 10 Celsius degrees, move average of daytime and nighttime temperatures, 28 14, 33 um, 8, uh, 18, 36 20. Also, we used a model to transform the air temperature to soil temperature. Uh, this model was calibrated with field data collected last year in the Great Salt Lake uh, wetlands. And we had three replicates for each treatment and uh, we used uh, 100 seats per replicate box. The germination percentage uh, was calculated after 30 days of incubation. To simulate a water stress, we add a bag to the water. In the experiment one, we simulated the five water potentials. That's uh, zero, uh, negative 0 0.15, negative 0 0.3, negative 0 0.6, negative 1.2 megapascal. And for the experiment two, we simulated the three water potentials. That's zero, negative 0 0.6, negative 1.2 megapascal. In total, uh, we use around 40,000 seeds in both experiments. Previous to the experiment one and two, we run a water potential gradient ranging from zero to negative 2.4 megapascal, which helped us to choose the water potentials for the experiments one and two. In this gradient, uh, phragmites germination germinated in all water experiments and all water uh, potentials, and the Chonoplectum acutus had no germination from negative 1.8 megapascal. In the data analysis uh, for the experiment one and two, we used a multi-way analysis of variance ANOVA to determine the main effects uh, include uh, three levels for a species, five levels to regions, four levels to temperature regimes, and uh, five levels to water potentials for experiment one, and the three levels of uh, water potentials to experiment two. We will also uh, use non-linear growth curves to visualize the germination. And uh, in these curves, uh, there are three typical parameters uh, derivated. Um, that, it, um, that it's uh, the lag phase, the growth rate, and the maximum growth, as you can see in this graph. Uh, in this study, we will present the results uh, for lag phase, how much time is it spent to start a germination, and the maximal growth uh, here is considered as the seed germination percentage. Our seeding trial was carried out in June and July in this summer. Uh, seed bags were installed in two places, in Farmington Bay and the Bear River in, at the Great Salt Lake wetlands. Um, there are, uh, wet, uh, these wetlands are um, free, uh, fresh water, it's not salt. And uh, we distrib distributed uh, 100 seeds of two native species, uh, that's Chenoplectons acutus and Chenoplectons americanus, among 16 germination plots, eight plots for each size. And um, for each plot, I uh, had a uh, temperature and also a soil water potential sensor. The temperature was registered every two hours and the water potential every four hours. 
uh, in total germination was recorded within four weeks. Um, we began to show the results of the experiment one that's between species variation. Here you can see the growth covers of the three species, the invasive pragmites and the tunate vigorous, Chenoplectons acutus and Chenoplectons americanus. Each column represents a temperature regime. And for each graph, you see you can see the water quotations results in different uh, growth curves. Uh, but uh, let's see more details in the next slides. Changes in temperature and the water potential impacted seed germination for all species. We observed a significant difference between species and also between water potentials. Pragmites had similar germination percentage to Chenoplectons acutus. And Chenoplectons americanus had lower germination percentage in all treatments. On the left, uh, you can see the temperature effect on seed germination percentage. All species had low germination with the lowest temperature regime, 2310 Celsius degrees. But only Chenoplectons acutus was affected by the higher temperature regime, 3620 Celsius degrees. On the right, you can see the water potential graph both Phragmites and Chenoplectons americanos had lower germination percentage under negative 0.6 megapascal. On the other hand, uh, Chenoplectons acutus showed more resistance to water stress. Germ its germination percentage changed only in the driest condition of a negative 1.2 megapascal. About the lag phase, uh, it was affected by the lower temperature regime and also by, by the lower water potential. In summary, uh, our finds for the experiment one showed that fragments had a germination percentage similar to Chenoplectons acutus. And it is germination was not affected by the projected temperatures of 2007. Chenoplectum acutus was vulnerable to hard temperature regimes. The projected temperature of July 2007 can be too extreme to its seed germination. And um, Chenoplectum americanus had the lowest germination percentage of all species but it wasn't affected by the 2007 projected temperatures. The lag phase was not affected by the future temperatures. Now we will start to describe the results of the experiment two, that's about uh, between population uh, variation of chenoplectons acutus. Here we present the growth curves of the five populations of, Chen of Chenoplectons acutus. Uh, each column represents the temperature regime and its line uh, population. For each graph, you can see three water potentials, zero, negative 0 0.6, and negative 1.2 megapascal. The germination percentage was lower on the negative 1.2 megapascal for all populations and the temperature regimes. Changes in temperature and the water potential impacted seed germination of Chenoplectons acutus. We observed the significant difference between temperature and between water potentials. We did not observe it 
significant differences between seed sourced from different regions. On the left, uh, you can see the temperature effect of on Chenoplectons uh, acutus seed germination percentage. Chenoplectons acutus had low germination with the lowest tem temperature regime, 23 10 Celsius degrees, and with the higher temperature regime, 36 20 Celsius degrees. On the right, you can see the water potential graph. Uh, when where uh, Chenoplectans acutus had lower germination percentage with negative 1.2 megapascal. We did not observe uh, any differ significant differences between seed sources from the different regions. However, a seed from Beer Lake the coldest site and the seeds from Faramaga, the hottest site, presented higher seed germination differences than sites with similar climate as Red Salt Lake and Kirk. The lag phase uh, can double with um, negative 1.2 megapascal for all temperature regimes. And the future projected temperature regimes did not affect the lag phase. The lag phase was affected um, by the, lo the lowest temperature regime, that's 23 and 10 Celsius degrees. As summary uh, for the experiments too, we could not detect significant differences between seeds sourced from the different regions. Changes in temperature and the water potential impacted Chenoplectons acute seed germination and the future temperature, July 2007, may affect the Chenoplecton acutus establishment in the field. Germination lag time was affected by the lower water potential and the, by the lower temperature regime, but not by the future projected temperatures. In the field, uh, we did not observe differences in temperatures and the water potentials between the sites. We set up the, the seed bags thinking some sites would become drier over time, but uh, in reality, the changes were, were not what uh, we expected. Our seeding trial pointed a lower germination percentage than one in the chambers. We expected it since uh, there, uh, there were more factors playing in the field like salinity and lower light. Also, the field temperatures um, were similar to the temperatures in the climate change in the climate uh, prediction models. Our most uh, important finds uh, with this experiment uh, were the future projected temperature regime. Um, affected only chenoplecton acute germination percentage, the lowest temperature regime, 23, 10 Celsius degrees, and the, water and the lowest water potential, affected seed germination percentage and lag phase for all species. Frogmites has a competitive uh, advantage with higher germination percentage and the short lag phase time in the current and the future projected climate and uh, there are no significant differences between Chenoplecton acute seeds sourced from the different regions. We can point some um, implications for wetland restoration. 
Um, now we can better predict the seed germination on native borage species and the phragmites under the current and the future climate scenarios. And uh, it is useful because uh, our finds can first uh, can support uh, models um, of wetland restoration and it can improve restoration strategies uh, for as chosen competitive species and a better time to seed them. For example, we learned that in the future, uh, early seeding of chenoplectons acutos can enhance its germination and establishment. And also that the chenoplectons American seeds will probably not be affected in the future climate and they maybe can be a competitive species for restoration in the Great Salt Lake. We also believe that uh, with using CD sourced from different regions, we can have a similar CD performance and also we can prove the genetic diversity of Chenoplectons acutus in, in the Great Salt Lake. Oh. Uh, I'm finally, and uh, I'm I'm really grateful for all the friends that I met in the, in the Utah State University during my fellowship. I thank you to Emily Martin for her amazing work in helping me to design and to execute this study. I thank you the Society of Wetland Scientists for this unique opportunity. Oh, sorry. And um, finally, um, I especially uh, I am especially grateful for Karen Catherine for her kind and uh, generous attention during my fellowship this summer. And, uh, yeah, we are open for questions. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Tatiana and Karen, for a really great presentation. Uh, it was really wonderful to get a glimpse into all of the work that you were able to do this past summer. Um, so I wanted to take a moment to get to the questions and answers. Let me pull this up here. Um, so if anyone has a question, make sure that you type it into the questions pane. Also, um, if you wanted to email Tatiana or Karen directly, their email addresses are right on the screen here. Um, so you can feel free to do that. All right, so uh, the first question that I have here is from Melissa Harrison. Um, the question is, do you know if there were similar nutrients available to the seeds grown in the chambers versus in the field? Hello, Melissa. Um, for sure, in the field, we have much more differences, and because it, it, we found uh, lower ger uh, germination in the field, and the growth chambers, we have a really uh, Controlled uh, experiment, it's just water and the uh, water stress and the no nutrients. But I think the nutrients in the water can cannot affect the city germination. Um, it can be more affected by light and the uh, water availability and also about the salinity in the water. Yeah, I think it's important to recognize that at least with early seed germination experiments, um, or at least when you're looking at just those first few weeks, basically the seed is relying on the seed reserves. So nutrients generally are not super important for germination, but like Tatiana is suggesting, it's really much more about salinity, light and moisture for that seed to seedling transition. Okay, um, so the next question that we have is from Sean Sharp. Um, Sean says, very interesting results. Do you anticipate this trend to be true outside of the Great Salt Lake region, particularly in the Great Lakes region? Uh, so sorry, I, I really 
Um, I didn't cut up the question, maybe Karin? Yeah, so it sounds like um, Sean is interested in knowing if the results we found in Great Salt Lake would be relevant elsewhere. I think um, a couple a couple things to think about. One is what are the other native species that you're dealing with? So um, if you have some of the same species like hard stem bulrush or three square bulrush generally, I would expect some of those results to be transferable, but of course, um, across the continent, hard stem bulrush in Utah versus along Lake Superior or wherever you might find it, um, you may actually, there's probably some variation in the germination responses within, within each of these native species across the continental scale. So, so that would be an interesting next step would be to compare native populations at a much larger scale. We did it within the Intermountain West because that was most relevant to the work that we're doing. But um, I think the other thing to consider is that with Phragmites, part of what seems to be giving it a competitive advantage here, which I think would also be transferable elsewhere, the Phragmites performance, I would expect to be similar in other regions too, that it just is much quicker to germinate that lag time or lag phase it germinates so quickly and that's part of why it can be such a good competitor. And the fact that it was doing really well under future hotter temperatures, those are the, those types of results are, I would expect to see for Phragmites and other regions in North America because it's such a widespread and well mixed species, the seeds, uh, it, you know, genetically speaking, it's very widespread across the continent rather than having lots of locally adapted populations. Okay, uh, the next question is from Kathleen Pietro. Uh, the question is, do you have ideas as to why you saw different responses between the two bulrush species? Was this an expected outcome? Um, one of the Borosha species, the Chenoplectons americanos, uh, grew up more in salinity water and uh, um, Yeah, I think uh, I think you're right, Tatiana, that they do tend to grow in different environments. And in the past, uh, in our other experiments that we've done with um, some of the work that my former student Jimmy Marty did, we always found lower germination with uh, three square bulrush, Unaplectus americanus versus hard stem bulrush. And so it may just be, you know, nuances between species. And uh, some of the things that, I, one of the things that's interesting is that the seed behavior between these two bulrush species don't necessarily indicate once it's established, both of them grow extremely robustly. They're both, um, you know, if once established, they'll be pretty good competitors against Phragmites, but it does seem like three square bulrush might have some seed limitations in terms of getting established initially and having lower germination rates. Beyond that, I'm not sure why, <laughs> why they had these differences. Yeah, and also one interesting point about the three square bull rush uh, that um, it, it, it was not affected by the with the higher temperatures um, when in, in our project had climate change uh, temperature the it will increase uh, the germination but uh, the opposite happened to chenoplectons acute yeah that's a good point Okay. Um, are there any more questions? Uh, please, if you have some, you can type them into the questions pane. We have a couple more minutes. Okay. Uh, another question. Um, how does uh, PEG change water potential? Oh, about the Mobeta effect. Um, 
it's um, a cable that you can add the, the water and you can, it can uh, also affect the interest of the water uh, because um, I think we're losing Tatiana a little bit, um, but basically it's a, um, it changes the, uh, basically how tightly bound or readily available water is, um, you know, I think through um, yeah, my chemistry, <laughs> my chemistry uh, uh, language is a little rusty, but basically it's how it affects how tightly or loosely bound water is and therefore how, how readily available water is to seeds. It's a it's a um, practice that has been around actually for many decades in horticulture and agricultural seed experiments, and it's a really useful tool, I think, for ecological experiments as well, because you can actually replicate water potentials that you might be interested in for your 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 system that you're working in, and and for these future climate change scenarios where even though we're working in wetlands, water may and can already be um, not as readily available as it has been in the past. So it may affect seed, seeds in that way. And, okay. and I guess I would say one more thing. If somebody is interested in um, using it as a tool or a technique for growth chamber experiments, we can send you the papers that lay out the methods for how to do it, this. Again, it's pretty well established protocol. Um, so at least it's a tried and true ap research approach. So people can email us directly and we can send you the papers that we used for these methods. Okay. Um, and yes, if, if anyone would like those, if you just want to email um, Karin, you can, you can get that from her. I think that would be a good way to access that. Uh, there is another question that just came in. Uh, for the seed field plots, was only one species present or were mixed species plots evaluated for germination success, i.e. rush in the presence of Phragmites? I think we may have lost Tatiana altogether, so I will answer oh, that question. No. But, uh, we, she had both hard stumble rush and three square bull rush in the seed packet, in the um, in the plots in the field. So they were mixed together, um, and we had set this up as she mentioned this. But in, uh, just to reiterate, our we set these up in places where we thought they'd end up having various water potentials by the end of the growing season, and in these different places, they ended up having much more water. These are heavily hydrologically managed wetlands. So nothing ended up drying down and getting very dry at all. <laughs> so that's why in the end, it wasn't as interesting as we were hoping. And it wasn't as good of a test of our um, water potential experiments in the growth chambers. But anyway, that was, that was what was available during the time that she was here. So we'd like to try this again in the field in the future just to, again, scale up what we found in the lab to the field. OK, great. Um, so I just wanted to uh, thank you, um, Karin. And um, if Tatiana's still on there, thank you very much for answering those questions. Um, and as I said, if anyone has any more questions they'd like to ask, please uh, just uh, you can directly email uh, Tatiana or Karen. Um, just some announcements pretty quick. Um, please mark your calendars for our next SWS webinar, which will be held on January 17th. Um, and that's actually 2019. And that will be presented by uh, Julie Follinsby and Brock Freyer, both of the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation. Also, we have a very special webinar coming up on January 31st, which will be presented in Spanish by Ivan Correa and Luisa Ricuarte. 
And as I said, if you're interested in being a wetland ambassador yourself, or if you happen to know someone that might like to apply, we just announced our wetland ambassador graduate research fellowship for the summer of 2019. So we have one fellowship available. Um, if you are a graduate student, you can apply to this, whether you're in a master's or PhD program. And we will award a grant of up to $5,000 for this. Um, and through this, the fellowship will provide the opportunity for a graduate student like Tatiana uh, to travel to another country and conduct wetland research. And uh, it's really an exciting opportunity. So if you are interested in applying, you can go to our website. Um, the deadline is Friday, January 25th, and uh, you can find all of the materials for application there. If you're interested, we wish you luck in applying, and uh, we look forward to seeing your applications. So uh, with that said, thank you everyone for attending this webinar. Thank you again to Tatiana and Karin for presenting. And uh, we look forward to you all joining us again for another webinar in the future. Thanks everyone and have a great rest of your day.